Good afternoon. Welcome back to another session. Now, today we're going to speak briefly on Damon Crawford's response to Cliff Hughes' um, interview, right? And Cliff Hughes was interviewing Damon Crawford regarding his party leaders, that, that is um, his party's leader, that's um, Mark Golding's dual citizenship. And Damon Crawford really handled Cliff Hughes with class mm -hmm. and with decorum. Right, two virtues that we're lacking now. We're seen lacking in many of our Jamaican politicians. They tend not to have that sense of decorum and the virtue of representing the Jamaican people with class and with intelligence. But I would say that on this occasion, Damon Crawford handled himself very well, and I have to congratulate him. We cannot just sometimes criticize our politicians, but when they do speak, what should be said and they speak the truth and we should congratulate them. And I think on this occasion, I have the distinct pleasure of congratulating um, Mr. Damon Crawford. Now, Cliff Hughes insisted that Damon Crawford should proffer him with his opinion as regards the party leaders, that's in Mr. Golding's dual citizenship. But Damon Crawford was very strident in his response and he made sure, he told Mr. Hughes that, you know, uh, as far as he's concerned, as far as Damon Crawford is concerned, he suggested that he did not want to proffer his opinion at that time because he is allowing the legal scholars and the legal experts to deal with it and also to include the Jamaican society in terms of what they decide. They will make a decision, the legal scholars along with the constituents, right, the electorate, they are the ones who will make decisions as far as Mark Golding's status of being a dual citizen is concerned. But one of the things that is interesting, and I must say this, is that the, the whole matter of dual citizenship is something that Cliff Hughes seems to be promoting. He seems to be obsessed with that topic, while there are other more important topics and matters that he should be discussing, such as the high homicide rate that we're seeing there. But, you know, but to Cliff Hughes, that is not important. Mind you, Cliff Hughes, I think sometime, was it this year or last year, his radio station was actually shut up in terms of gunmen, you know, um, looters and you know, people who were seeking to, I don't know, perhaps assassinate him. I don't know what they were doing, but, you know, his entire radio station was um, a scene of gunshots and, you know, and the entire station scene was shut up at least the exterior of the building. Now, what is important to Jamaica at this point in time is the fact that we are currently not heading in the right direction. I think Mr. Cliff Hughes could also speak about the new constitution that Marlene Mullerhoe Ford and her colleagues are actually crafting. I think he should be looking at some of the sections, the clauses, and begin now to educate using his platform, the very important platform that he has to educate Jamaicans about where we're heading in terms of constitutional reforms. But as far as he's concerned, he was there to uh, speak about Mark Holding's dual citizenship when Mark Holding is not the only person in parliament, in the Jamaican parliament, that is a dual citizen. In fact, on Friday or Thursday last week of last week, we learned that Julian Robinson, another important MP in the People's National Party, is likewise a British citizen. So we have a number of people who might not yet have declared themselves, but are dual citizens. And we cannot just be looking at one man because he's a leader of the position and say that, yeah, he should be the one to receive the flag, right? And we should castigate him and leave the others unbothered. We should be having uh, an objective, an open, transparent conversation about dual citizenship. However, at the moment, the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, allows dual citizenship from Commonwealth countries, right? So we should not be having that conversation. Or if we have that conversation, we should be doing it in light of trying to change the Constitution in a way that fits, that accords with the Jamaican realities. I understand that um, Mr. Curtis Ward 
who was a former Jamaican ambassador to the United Nations, uh, suggested that dual citizenship should not be a problem. And I agree with him. And he is desirous of having U.S. dual citizens also be qualified to work in the Jamaican parliament. And I agree 100% with Mr. Curtis Ward. And, you know, in his interview with uh, Zara Burton, I read an, an article that she actually wrote on Substack, um, having interviewed Mr. Curtis Ward, and she was, you know, presenting the argument, the counter argument that is in Jamaica, that, you know, dual citizens are, you know, more susceptible, they're more vulnerable to betraying common trust. But that is not true, right? That is, there is no research to suggest that people who are dual citizens are more vulnerable to um, committing, you know, betrayal, acts of betrayal, right, and treason. Absolutely no research. And that is so interesting. We'd like to talk. And even these so-called intellectuals and the pseudo-intellectuals that we have in Jamaica, in particular, they like to speak and there is no scientific research that has been done to suggest that we've had the members of parliament in Jamaica because of their dual citizenship they have betrayed us. But let us look at Mr. Siago, for example, that many people like to, you know, hoist on this level that he was very, very an, an honorable man. The JLP liked to do that, right? That he's an, he was an honorable man and he gave up his US citizenship when he became a member of parliament um, in Jamaica. But remember now that in the 1970s and 80s, you know, particularly during the 70s, that Mr. Siago was and the 80s too. Right, he worked very well for the CIA, right? And you know, you could say that he, you know, betrayed common trust in many ways, right? Mr. Serna did that, even though he, according to what you're saying, that he had renounced his US decision. I'm not going to say suggest who did and who did not, because a lot of times we don't know who the who has done and who has not. They probably say that they have, but how can we even prove there is no evidence? right now to suggest that Mr. Seren renounced his US citizenship. He might have, I'm not suggesting that he did not, but I'm suggesting that I do not have that evidence. Even the ones who are coming out now in recent times saying that they have renounced, I can only listen to them and take them at their word. But at this current moment, particularly our, how our politicians like to lie and to deceive, I cannot trust them and think that yeah, whatever their words, their word is their bond, because oftentimes their word is not their bond. And Jamaica needs to understand that. I'm not, not suggesting that we should say nay when they have said that they have done it, right? Because we ought not to judge, but we also need not to be fools, right? We have to be critical thinkers and to approach things and to examine things with an open mind, not based on what people have said, but based on their actions. But the whole matter of dual citizenship, as Mr. Um, Kripuz was suggesting, um, he was suggesting that how can he be loyal to Jamaica when he has sworn to another country. But as we have said on this channel for so many times that our politicians who also have single citizenship, a lot of times they have also betrayed us. And that is why Jamaica is in the current position in which it finds itself, because we find that our Jamaicans, black as I am, have betrayed us on many occasions, right? And Mr. recently, Mr. Patterson, who was at the University of the West in this, uh, making his grandiose pronouncements because he's no longer batting, as he suggested, right? He's no longer batting, and so he doesn't have to be in that cricket arena. Right, uh, he's no longer the political as it were arena, so he's not required to be batting. But yet, still, they like to come and they like to, you know, have these wonderful and soaring rhetoric, suggesting as if they were these upright and, you know, um, men of integrity, honorable men when they were in the position. When Mr. Patterson, if the truth be told, betrayed us on many occasions. Right, we most of Jamaica is sold out. Right, even the highways and the high tolls that Jamaicans have to pay, and they will have to pay these two tolls for years. And you know, think about, for example, Portmore. 
a very small community, so near to Kingston, and people who are leaving their homes and they're using the highway. And I'm not suggesting that highways should not have been constructed, right? Because it does alleviate and it reduces the time, reduces the time that one had the travel time, the commuting time, right? The time of commute. But the fact of the matter is to have that high toll, I am opposed to the high toll rates that Jamaicans continue to pay. And these tolls go up so often. And when you think of the proximity of Port Moore to Kingston, it's really a block away. Why do people have to pay both tolls back and forth to go and to come? I think that to leave, yes, but not to return. If they've paid their toll in the morning, they should not have to pay to return to their homes. Right? I think that that is something that the Jamaican government could have done better and could have negotiated thinking about people and the fact that our economy has not been growing and that the cost of living has been going up um, tremendously, significantly over the years. But, you know, and that we talk about our beaches, and that was also done under Mr. P.J. Patterson, and lots of other things have been sacked about. That was also overseen by Mr. Patterson. And these are people who say that they are loyal to Jamaica. And they have Jamaica's best interest at heart. But do they really have Jamaica's best interest at heart? They don't, right? While perhaps a dual citizen might have Jamaica's best interest at heart. Because even though they might have you know, citizenship belonging to another country, they often are not first-class citizens, as I've told you. Many of our Jamaican people, they know that they are third-class citizens you know, at best. Right, they're not first class citizens, and many of them are not comfortable living there. The only reason they're there is because our country is not secure. Many Jamaicans would have left Great Britain, even some of them the United States, years ago. But they understand that should they return to the land of their birth, that they would not be secured in their homes on their properties. So they have to remain. Right, and if the truth be told a large number of those who have been leading us, a number of them, a large number of them had single citizenship. But let me just educate Jamaicans also about the whole matter of citizenship. These politicians who are largely in bed with our financial elites, having finished their tenure as politicians, they leave the office with loads of money, right? And a lot of times they have connections with international people because Jamaica is a corporate state, right? It's not the public state that we think it is. It's a corporate state, it's a corporation. And the politicians are there and they compete in terms of who will be the wealthiest having limited office, right? And that is what they're doing even as we speak, right? So make no bones about it. Your politicians are not sent, you are not sending them there to uplift and to build the infrastructure of the Jamaican population. That's why you're seeing that our public school system is in a deplorable condition. Our hospitals, they're crippled, right? To say the least, and everything there is not functioning. There is nothing that we can say when you look at Jamaica, no public sector, right? No public facility or institution. You can say, wow, after independence, we can surely give the government a B or B plus um, having been great stewards of that particular institution, public institution. Nothing, whether it's the hospitals, all right, or the school system, or the transportation system, or the water system, just about anything. Nothing in Jamaica works effectively, right? Or is functioning in a normal capacity, right? It's everything is abnormal and ineffective. And all politicians, have not apologized. In fact, they think that they were th these great stewards of such, you know, um, dysfunctional situations and a dysfunctional country, as it were, right? National security, water, everything, transportation, roads, everything is just not functioning as it should be functioning. Today, I was watching also a clip from a YouTuber, uh, a Jamaican YouTuber, by the way, and he was looking at Mr. Holmes's house that is in Beverly Hills, one of those very elite communities. But when he was looking, because you know, Mr. Holmes's house is on the top of the hill, right? Those elite houses, those people who have money, they live on the top of the hill. 
and he's looking down in the gully, right? In you know, from where he was from the, the where Mr. Hose's house is perched. And when you look in those gullies, right, you see all littered with garbage, right? And this is near to the Prime Minister's home. And I am sure that the Prime Minister is not blind. He's able to look down and see that from where he stands, where this mansion is, that he's looking down and he's seeing garbage. And that too is not taken care of. When you look at the roads that lead to some of these very wealthy communities also, these roads are, roads are not properly maintained. They're not paved. They do not represent the class that live in these communities. We have lost a sense of civic pride, right? So the fact of the matter is, I think nobody really, when you go to Jamaica and you look at the infrastructure and you look at the decrepit conditions of our roads and just about our buildings and just about everything there, you know, with a, a few, of course, with the exceptions of a few modern buildings that we have not really upkept and maintained adequately the infrastructures there in Jamaica, right? And we have our so-called academic elites who like to foist their worldview upon the ordinary Jamaican by telling us that Jamaicans want to sever from the monarchy. I can tell you that a lot of people who are shouting and screaming is not because they really want to sever. They're just simply, you know, shouting and screaming and, you know, what they hear from the media and coming from the academic people. It's just like during the time of Christ, when Christ was being murdered, right, by the high priest, a lot of the Jews were not in agreement with it. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't say a lot, but some of them were not in agreement with it. But they went ahead with it because that's what their leaders were doing. And they were just following what their next door neighbors and the crowd was doing. They were just simply going along with the crowd. The pandemic, I don't have to talk about that. People generally like to follow popular and they like to follow the majority. And whatever the majority is doing within their group, they think that that is what should be done, right? And if people are crying that they want the, um, the rabbis and they want Jesus to be crucified, then, then we want Barabbas, even though Barabbas was a known criminal. But the people kept on saying that they wanted Barabbas, right? Because they foisted and projected their own evil nature onto Christ, and then they projected their, well, Christ, you know, royal and his righteous status to Barabbas. And Barabbas, they knew was even Pilate himself knew that Barabbas was a criminal and Christ was a righteous man. In fact, he was a God man. But, you know, I, I just made that analogy to let you to see that many Jamaicans actually are not clamoring for any severance of ties with the British monarchy. Because when you look online, many Jamaicans are aware that Jamaica has not moved on since independence. That we have modest, we have made some modest improvements. I'm not going to hit everything down and say that we have not improved anything, right? But we have made some modest improvements, but those modest improvements are below average, right? It's below average. We could have done better. It's almost like you could have gotten 80% on your math test, and you because you're so lazy and you did not use the right strategies, you got, you know, a 50% and you passed, right? You got a C and you're able to move on, right? But it doesn't mean therefore that that was your best, right? Others would have outgone to you and they are the ones who perhaps would go to the top medical schools and they, you know, and those schools which are more competitive. We find ourselves that we are not competitive among countries even within the Caribbean region. I'm not talking about our personal countries. Jamaica is not competitive with even poor third world countries within the region. And this is something that we have to come to grips with. So talking about dual citizenship, as Mr. Hughes was trying to um, insist that your know, Damon Talbot should be dealing with that matter, was unnecessary. Mr. Cliff Hughes should be the one to be educating, using his platform, the people in terms of the constitution and what we should be doing, engaging them and enlightening their mind 
about instead of becoming so obsessed and paranoid about being obsessed with and paranoid about, about rather, Mr. Golding's dual citizenship. That, Mr. Cliff Hughes, is politics. And you showed then, you exhibited that you are not elevating the conversation, right? And that the perch from where you sit, on which you sit, um, you are not really trying to uplift the land of Marcos Mazergo. You're not trying to do that, Cliff Hughes. And I don't know if you are not every day losing your credibility, Cliff Hughes, and you, you, you are talented and you could really be doing something better to uplift the standard, to elevate the conversation in Jamaica. But you have decided, Mr. Hughes, that you will not do that. You prefer, because I'm not sure if you're receiving financial rewards, you decide that you want to, um, you know, disperse, as it were, diffuse the official narrative coming from the government and dividing our people. At the end of the day, you're dividing our people. And as I'm saying here, I'm not a pro 100% Mark Golding's um, follower. I'm not a fan of any of them. I'm not a fan of Mark Golding. I'm not a fan of Andrew Davis. But my understanding is that we should be looking as persons with intelligence, God blesses you with intelligence and a mind to think and to think critically that we ought to look at the matter from non-partisan lens and then begin to educate our people as to what the best or better choice might be in terms of the two-party system. Because the, the, the two-party system in Jamaica is obviously a duopoly. Even in the United States, people have found out that for years that the system in America is not a democracy, that it is a duopoly, it is an oligarchy. Why are we sitting in Jamaica believing that we are this democracy where ideas clash and they contend? The ideas don't clash. In the first place, we don't even have enough information for ideas to clash, right? Because most of the times our politicians do not tell us the truth. If we get 40% of the truth, we're lucky. Right? So think about a nation you know, functioning on less than 40% of what is truth. And that is where we're having the voter apathy that we're seeing on the island because our journalists are not unearthing the truth to us and helping us to get a better understanding of who our politicians are. The journalists are so lazy that they themselves are not even writing books. They are the ones also, in addition to the intellectuals at the University of the West Indies and some of the other universities in Jamaica, they're the ones, the journalists are the ones who should be writing books about our politicians. But I know they're afraid. And yet they tell us that the Jamaica is one of those countries that has had a free press and all of that nonsense. Right? A free press. And I don't know if any journalist, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of any journalist in Jamaica writing a book in which they have unmasked the corruptions that we see in Jamaica. I don't know of one, you know, Dion Jackson Miller, and she, I'm sure she has not done that, right? Um, and Cliff Hughes, I'm sure he has not done that. And lots of others, they have not done any of that sort of undertaking, right? Nothing like that have they ever done, right? Yet still we say that we, know our politicians or we pretend to know our politicians. We pretend to know the facts. We pretend to have the evidence. We quite frankly don't have the evidence. And that is why I have, you know, really created this channel to ask the hard questions, to pose those questions and to challenge the thinking, to let us know that a lot of what we think we know, we don't know because we have not been given sufficient information on which to build our analysis, right? We have not, because this is Jamaica that we give it. So, Mr. Damon Crawford, I really, really commend you for really demonstrating that sense of um, decorum and decency in not trying to, you know, um, besmirch, as it were, Mark Golding's character, 
even though you could have because you are opponent, you I know that your desire is becoming the party leader, but you decided to stay away from that, right? And to elevate the standard, to, to control your emotions, right? And that was good. I applaud you for that, Mr. Mr. Uh, Crawford, David Crawford. And I look forward, Mr. Crawford, if you're listening to this video, um, to interview you one of these days. I think that I would definitely like to have a conversation with you, Damon Crawford, if you're listening, and I will try to see if I can find your email somewhere. And if anybody has his contacts and would like to send his contact address, his email address, I'd like to contact Mr. Crawford in terms of having a chat with him about where he sees Jamaica moving, um, um, in what direction he sees us and where are we going uh, from here. Now, thank you so much for joining. Um, please be sure to like and to share and to subscribe. And remember now that this is the thinking channel. I'm not about to become here and have all these gossips and, you know, and shouting and carrying on nonsensically. We're here to think, right? And I'm not apologizing for elevating the standard because that is what this channel is about. And I hope that Jamaicans will just move away from this party politics, from this autism politics, and begin to have podcasts that are devoted to rendering an objective analysis of what is happening in Jamaica. All the best to you. Ciao.